students, it's good to have you here. Thank you for joining me. <laughs> in today's uh, third installment on my coverage of organic chemistry, I'm going to teach you about hydrocarbon polarity, IUPAC naming, and stereochemistry. A lot of big fancy words. What do they mean? I don't know. Let's just get into it and see if we can figure it out. Shall we? All right, let's begin. So, as it turns out, carbon and hydrogen are almost equally electronegative, which means that carbon-hydrogen bonds are generally very nonpolar. This makes it so that hydrocarbons as a whole are usually nonpolar and consequently don't dissolve in water. We can see that illustrated in this cute little YouTube video to which I'll link here, and I invite you to click on it to watch it. Now, this nonpolarity can be overcome if hydrogen atoms in the hydrocarbon are replaced by polar appendages like OHs, for example. For instance, glucose and ascorbic acid, or vitamin C, are both soluble in water. Here are their structures. You might ask, why? Why are they soluble in water? The reason is because they have lots of polar OHs. If we replaced all of these OHs in these molecules with hydrogen atoms, however, these molecules would become more and more nonpolar and hence more and more insoluble in water for each OH replaced with a hydrogen. Got it? Good. Here's my next subject, IUPAC naming. Now, IUPAC, which stands for the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, is an international organization of internationality and internationalness that has developed a systematic way of naming all chemical compounds on Earth. In fact, all of the techniques for naming compounds that I've taught you this year in general chemistry actually follow IUPAC naming rules. So believe it or not, you've actually already been doing this for quite a while. Now, this system, called the IUPAC naming system, is particularly useful for organic compounds. In general, all organic compounds' IUPAC names look like this where we've got a bunch of substituent names followed by a parent chain name. You might look at that and think, what is a substituent and what is a parent chain? Don't worry, I'll explain. At a general chemistry level, and it actually goes deeper than this if you get into organic chemistry level, but at this level at least, I'm going to keep it simple. At this level, <laughs> the parent chain is the longest straight, unbranching carbon chain that you can find in your molecule. Substituents are any appendages that are dangling off of that chain. For example, in this molecule right here, the longest straight unbranching carbon chain, the parent chain, is the one highlighted inside this blue box. So if you try and trace carbon to carbon to carbon to carbon, the longest straight chain that you can get in any direction is that one. All of the light blue colored groups that are dangling off of this parent chain are called substituents. So when we're naming a compound using the IUPAC naming system, we name it by using the following pattern. Substituents names first, followed by the parent chain name tacked onto the end. The parent chain's name is dependent upon how long it is, as table 24.2 that I'll show you on the next slide indicates. Here is that table. For a one carbon long chain, it's called methane. Two carbons long is ethane. Three carbons is propane, butane, pentane, hexane, heptane, octane, nonane, and decane, as shown here. Those are the names. Now for you, my students, who are actually taking this class from me, I require you to memorize these names and the number of carbons that they correspond to. Is that because I'm mean? Yeah, it is. But I have the power to enact my meanness through giving you questions about it on a test. Ha <laughs> ha! So because the parent chain in this compound is seven carbons long, its parent chain name is heptane. That's the chain name for seven carbons. You'll notice then that there are these CH3s coming off of carbons two, right here, four, and five. You'll also notice that there's a CH2 CH3 coming off of carbon three. So how do we name those substituents? Well, according to the table on the previous slide, a one carbon group is called methane, and a two carbon group is called ethane. So let's move our molecule over here to the upper right hand corner of the screen remembering that we have to name this molecule by throwing its substituents names on it the first followed by its parent chain name tacked onto the end. So once again we just barely saw that these one carbon long groups coming off of carbon 5, carbon 4, and carbon 2 from our parent chain are all methanes. You'll notice that I've got a two carbon long chain coming off of carbon 3. It is an ethane. So in order to make an IUPAC name for this entire molecule, I have to take these IUPAC names of these substituents, methane and ethane, and have their ane endings replaced with the suffix YL. These substituents are then listed in alphabetical order before the parent chain. 
Hence, our compound could be named 3-ethyl. See, I've got an ethane chain coming off of carbon-3, so it's 3-ethyl, 2-methyl, 4-methyl, 5-methyl heptane. Got it? I hope that all makes sense. So the substituents, once again, have their ane parts of their names replaced with the suffix yl. You'll notice that I put the ethyl group before all the methyls because the letter E comes alphabetically before the letter M. Now, we can, of course, make this name a little bit more compact because the substituents found on carbons 2, 4, and 5 are all the same. So we can simplify the name as being 3-ethyl, 2,4,5 trimethyl heptane, indicating that there are three methyl substituents, one attached to carbon 2, one attached to carbon 4, and one attached to carbon 5 in my heptane parent chain. And attached to carbon 3 of the heptane, there is an ethyl. That is the full IUPAC approved name for this molecule. So to summarize, to name an alkane using the IUPAC naming rules, we first find the parent chain, which is the longest straight unbranching carbon chain. Also, I should mention that if you can find two chains that have the exact same length, you should always choose the one with the largest number of branch points as being your parent chain. Next, count the number of carbon atoms in the parent chain and then name it according to the names listed on table 24.2 that I showed you earlier, which I require you, the students who actually take this from me, to memorize. Third, we identify and number the substituents in whichever direction gives them the lowest number. Now, when I say substituents, what I mean is any appendage that is dangling off of the main or parent chain. Fourth, we write the name as a single word, throwing the substituents where we replace the ane suffix with the suffix yl at first, and then tacking the parent chain name onto the end. And by the way, we list the substituents in alphabetical order using the prefixes di, tri, tetra, penta, and so forth, if the same substituent is present multiple times in the molecule. Do you got it? Let's see, by taking a look at some examples. I want you to assign IUPAC names to each of the following molecules. Now, I'm not going to do any of these for you here, but I invite you to attempt them on your own. And then if you wish, you can click the link here to a separate video in which I'll do some of them for you. That takes us to the end of this lecture video. Please stay tuned to the next one in which I'll introduce you to organic functional groups. Until next time, students, have an enjoyable rest of your day.